He turned an investment banker and now is one of the world's experts in, in corporate security and intelligence. Now, is that a career path? That's a fantastic career path. Love to know more about that journey. He, he founded, is it Civil Line? Yep. Perfect. Um, in 2010, in order to bring a new approach to understanding and valuing world risks. All right, so he'll be helping us understand our world today, including if we, as procurement professionals, need an umbrella based off of his world forecast. Okay, so stay tuned for that. Uh, please help me in thanking Justin for his years of service and for his service for us today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, not least uh, because I'm currently working on about six RFPs, so having the entire room full of procurement people at my mercy uh, is, is a thoroughly nice break, so uh, I'm most grateful for that. Um, and thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, I've got a few things to cover. We've got about half an hour of me talking until you get bored, and then there's 10 minutes of Q&A, but actually I'd like to take questions as we go along. I'm quite happy to make this a discussion, um, and actually, as you'll see, I'll take a bit of risk in the presentation uh, on the technology side, which I think is something we've been talking about this morning already. Um, it's actually a non-linear type of presentation, so I'll be getting a little bit of input from yourselves um, to keep things a bit more interesting um, as we go through. Um, what I want to cover is a little bit about um, the world next year. Um, I think we're all feeling pretty optimistic about how great it's going to be and how well everything's going on the planet, um, which is why I normally speak just ahead of uh, usually drinks, but you're getting me ahead of lunch today, so hopefully there's some beer at lunch to uh, help dull the pain. Um, and as a spoiler, you probably do need an umbrella in the next few years, but I think we're getting quite used to that now. And um, you know, it is an interesting time to be, to be doing this sort of thing. I'm also going to talk a bit about the approach um, that I take to intelligence, what it is, it's a very loaded term in a lot of the world, and I think even in uh, the UK and the US, it's still very loaded. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, demystify some of the things that we do, and um, try and give you a few things to take away for your own organizations. And my basic view is that you know, intelligence is something we can all be better at, and it doesn't have to cost you anything. Uh, wait a second, I sell stuff in this space. Um, it's, you really need an expert to help you get the most out of it, and fortunately, I know it's people. Um, so you're very kind about my background. Um, I am fortunate in that I had a mixed background because I get bored easily, so I started um, uh, as an investment banker. I was always an army reservist, and in September 2001, funnily enough, I got called up and went away to various exciting parts of the world where I met some very interesting people over a number of years. Um, was taught a few languages, um, none of which I can still remember how to speak, but it was very good at the time, and um, generally got involved in things I hadn't fully expected to be doing. And I think um, that helped define my career path, as you very kindly said, um, I ended up doing some interesting work for the UK government. I'm actually still serving as a reservist. Um, I'll touch on that a little bit later because I work with what we call the uh, Defence uh, Concepts and uh, Development Centre, which looks at things including futures, uh, which ties into what I do in my normal life. So um, I have a few things about that later, and I think there's some interesting things there, touching very much on the human 2.0 um, discussion from earlier on uh, that I'm going to cover over. Um, I do occasionally get time for hobbies. I try and do things that take me well away from um, any sort of internet access. Um, which is getting increasingly difficult, but uh, that's what I try and do. Okay, so the whole point of intelligence. Um, the best insight in the world is no good if no one acts on it, and that is the whole point. Um, there have been many things where we had all the intelligence and then a decision maker didn't operate. Um, anyone has a guess as to who this lady is? It's Troy burning in the background, if it might help some of you. Anyone want to take a guess? It's not Helen. But that's one everyone jumps for, of course. Um, this lady called Cassandra, anyone heard of her? So she was fated to always tell the truth and to have no one listen to her. And that was a curse. And um, that's something that can happen a lot in intelligence circles. Communication is difficult anyway at the best of times. Communication when you're trying to get across very complex ideas in a very short time frame in a very difficult and volatile world is even more difficult. So, I mean, I put that there um, partly as well because I'm gonna have to cover quite a broad range of things in just half an hour or so. Um, of course, what intelligence really matters is to you as a decision maker. That could be very granular. So again, that's why I want to take questions as we go through to try and give you something that kind of is more useful and actionable for yourselves. And you can grab me at any point today as well with anything specific. Um, another thing we had is a chap called Admiral John Godfrey. He was um, the model for M in the James Bond films. If uh, obviously you may have seen those, um, and he had a 13 rules of intelligence, um, and rule nine was saying you had to be 
um, using showmanship in your presentation. So again, um, I'm trying to do a clever thing here, and forgive me if the technology lets me down as we go through. But I think it's important, a lot of this is about how you sell stuff. And especially in this environment where there is so much noise from information. You know, we're bombarded with stuff all the time. I mean, we're, we're mostly aware of stuff that's going on. So the problem for the intelligence uh, professional now in any environment is cutting through that noise to give you something that actually suits, is actionable. You know, you can all read the headlines. You can get the headlines instantaneously. You can get raw material, Twitter. So, you know, what is intelligence adding that you're not getting from this other information? So to do this, we use a thing called the intelligence cycle. Has anyone heard of this? Well, those of you here last year should have done, so you obviously weren't paying attention to my talk. No. Um, I'm kidding. Um, I need to pitch the intelligence cycle. Uh, it is not this, but that would be pretty cool, and I think to many people it might as well be. Um, it is actually this, which is where we effectively derive intelligence from information. So it, it basically, behind what we do is a pretty detailed system that kind of takes all this information that's out there, makes sense of it, examines it, and tries to come up with something a decision maker can use. And I'd show you that really just to make the point that you know, there is a science behind how we can make sense of things. And again, this is something that anyone can apply. It's the difference between reading the newspapers and reading the newspapers with a purpose and sending an email afterwards to people as an implication. Um, and that's very, very simply what it is. Um, and of course, what it relies on is knowing what you care about. So if I come back to you, one thing to think about in the world and in intelligence, it's work out what you think you need to know. The problem we often have is people come back and say, tell me what I should know. And even the CIA has this problem. You know, and the government says, tell us everything that's going on. And they're like, well, what do you care about? And they go, I don't know, what should I care about? And that's how we miss things. So the more you can work out what you care about in your world, the better off you'll be, because then you'll be able to focus resources on cutting through the noise and getting to what matters. So keep that in mind as we go through. Okay, so now on to the really depressing part. Um, I've got five themes I'm gonna talk about. Um, you know, as we look towards the world in 2020, and I'll be fair, I am a risk professional, so of course I'm gonna look at the downsides. Um, Joking aside, I will encourage you to look at the fact we live in an unrivaled period of world peace. We've stamped out an awful lot of major diseases. Everyone's living longer. Uh, infant mortality is you know, dropping away towards uh, being negligible. Poverty, much as we focus on it, is still actually, compared to historic norms, very low. There are more functioning democracies in the world than ever. There are less dictators. Um, and frankly, in many ways, actually things are going pretty well. Um, but nonetheless, I've got five very depressing things that we'll talk about. Um, <laughs> But underneath that, actually, let's face it, we're doing international business. You know, um, we are operating, your firms are operating worldwide. You know, these are things that would not have been thinkable 50 years ago in the same way as they are now. So you know, do take that with a little bit of a pinch of salt. But these things are pressing. Right, so what I'm going to ask, we're not going to go through these in any particular order. So I'm just going to pick on people that I think aren't paying attention and ask them to, um, and ask them to pick a, um, uh, an icon, and we'll explore each one in turn. And I'll try not to accidentally do the same one twice, which has happened to me in the past. But uh, go on, I'll ask you to start then. Pick an icon. Bottom left, okay, thank you. I gotta have help for the back on this one. Okay, environmental and resource use. I think that's something we've heard quite a lot about, right? So this is a theme, obviously it's been emerging a lot. I've talked about this for a number of years. Um, you know, I think we're now really kind of seeing this in the mainstream um, in a way that it's really impacting companies and in perhaps a way I hadn't done before. So there's lots of areas of consideration. I think, First of all, obviously, we've got the very public side of the environment, pressure around that, the desire now for very rapid change and huge, whole-scale, global change to try and um, countermand the things that we're seeing. And that does affect, again, resources, and you've seen the volatility of that even just this week in what's been happening in um, Iran and Saudi Arabia and the effects in the Gulf. Um, and especially in this sort of just-in-time world now, there's a lot of competition for these resources. Um, and, of course, the natural resources companies need and the natural resources that people live off, and think again of the Jordan River Valley and things like this, you know, there are so many pressures around these things. And I highlight water. Some of you may have heard the theory that the next war will be about water and not oil. We've had the oil wars, it'll be the water wars. This is probably a little bit over-exaggerated, but there are around 100 major river basins in the world that have no sharing agreements around them. And we have multiple nations depending on these things. So actually, as the environment gets more scarce and we have problems with uh, access to many of these resources, those things are going to carry on fueling, fueling conflict at a slow rate. But we've already seen a few sparks around damming the Nile. And again, the Jordan Valley has really suffered because of what's been going on in Syria. And again, these things are very slow burn, so they're very easy to ignore. But any of those things can start leading um, to quite significant pressure. 
And again, grazing land use in Africa has been a really big deal. And that's helping drive migration, movement to cities, population expansion, and actually drive migration certainly into um, Western countries. And we've seen the kind of the, the, the effects that that's had. So this is something that will just keep burning away. And whatever policies one takes about migration and the movement of people, it's going to keep happening. Um, there are going to be more people, and they're going to try and be coming to where the jobs are. And it is young, working people that move. So we will see that um, just carry on again. Now, that fuels organized crime. It fuels, um, as we know, different forms of the economy. And we'll see those trends gradually flow through the next year. Now, obviously, again, you get more and more impact on this as people get more worried about things. Um, I don't think that we'll see um, sort of violent, very violent environmental protests. We're seeing partly deliberately violent environmental protests at the moment, but they're doing damage to property and not damage to people. Um, there is a growing movement, and I, I briefed this um, with the UK Parliament about five years ago. There is a growing potential, I would say, down the line um, for that to become something where actually there is a degree of, I won't say sort of environmental terrorism, but there is already a growing thing that humans are the problem. And I think we've seen a growth in, for example, right-wing extremism based on some of these factors, of course, migration, things driven by that. But I think behind that, there is a movement um, and a potential for people who are getting somewhat deranged about things, kind of say, we need a new plague and things like this. So trends around that are growing a bit. And the idea that I think where it mostly affects us in the short term is going to be things like, again, damage to commercial interests, damage to commercial properties. You know, and I think behind that, there is already a movement of people voluntarily not having children. Because they think there are too many people in the world, they won't have children. Other people shouldn't have children. We should stop having children. And you know, they're preaching that humans should just go away and leave the planet to it. You know, I, I worry about that, because I think that's the next, I think that's the ideology of the middle of this century. Not to worry about next year, but bear it in mind. Uh, this, is, this is big, slow burn stuff, and we're just seeing the symptoms of it over time. And there have been cults that have done stuff like this in the past. So these things could happen. Shouldn't affect us too much as corporations. Your bigger problem is going to be the pressure you'll be under that suddenly everyone dramatically cares what they didn't a year ago, um, and that'll affect things. And of course, the backlash against that, which I think will play out in political events. Okay, in fact, sorry, can we go, ooh, let's go back one. Uh, there we go, yeah, if you go back up to the top, let's pick a different one. Um, you've got a bit of a look there. Go on then. Tanya, I'll ask you to pick one, go on. <laughs> we haven't done the handshake, you're all right with that one, don't worry. See, this is all, you've got to pay attention now, you see, because otherwise, you can... okay, this is brilliant. Yep, handshake, please. Okay, so the realignment of global power. Um, we've seen quite a lot of stuff around this. Um, the thing I'd really kind of bear in mind is the post-Cold War political era that we're living through. Um, so we went from really having a world of two superpowers to one superpower that was seen as beneficent and, and nice, and thank you very much, United States, uh, for being a very nice superpower for a long period of time. Um, we're now seeing a, an era of global rivalry again. And this is stuff that we've lived through in the history books, but none of us, unless someone's really hiding their age very well, has lived through in this room. Um, you know, this kind of world where actually there are so many competing um, power centers and cores, and actually the big global standards that we've lived under and that have given us this prosperity and the fact we're all here talking about global trade um, are breaking down to some extent. Now, what's interesting, of course, is that economic connections have grown so strong, and then we have so much political fragmentation over the top of it. And I'm, you live this every day. I'm sure you understand what I'm talking about when you look at things like you know, Huawei and you know, how to integrate with things from China, supply chains through China or Mexico, and you know, issues where people are breaking these boundaries and breaking these connections. Um, obviously, it's accelerated quite a lot in the last five years, but this trend's been building for 30 years. Um, and certainly since 2008, when China really started to expand, become seen as a, rather than a potential future threat, we start to be seen as actually a, a very major global power. India is, of course, also coming up. And I think regardless of the 2020 election here, you know, the stage is set for the fact that China and the US will be the rivals of this century, certainly the first half of this century. And there are probably about five or six other powers um, on the edge of that that will also be trying to jockey and compete. And you're seeing that with Saudi Arabia, Iran, Russia, um, and a few others. So you know, there's quite a lot of stuff going on with these things. And it doesn't really matter what happens next year. I think that trajectory is set under the surface. And it'll be quite hard to roll back now to a very friendly, pally, well, we're all going to get along, and there's a bright future for all of humanity together. You know, these, these fragmentations will have to play out. And partly, what's been going on now is an attempt to sort of stop it before it gets, you know, further down the line uh, to some extent, which is bringing forward conflict now to try and kind of defuse conflict later. Um, so again, it won't change, I think, regardless of whoever gets in. Um, 
what does it mean for companies? Well, of course, you know, I think five, ten years ago, everyone felt pretty positive about going into new markets. There was a lot of expansion. Um, certainly, if you look at you know, even three, four years ago, there was huge pressure to go into Iran. People wanted to go into Iran because it was a great potential market that was untapped. Um, and, of course, there was government pressure to go into Iran because you know, it was seen as bringing about a political settlement and actually if we could rehabilitate Iran in the eyes of the international community and the economy was better, they wouldn't be building nuclear weapons and, and things would be better. Now, unfortunately, you know, that sort of thing has changed and a lot of companies got caught in the middle of that. Not so much US ones, but a lot of European countries got very caught because they were being pushed very hard and still are by their governments to be somewhere where things are going the other way. Similarly, even with Saudi Arabia, you know, um, there are companies that have been pushed to get in and now they're being criticized for being there um, because of the volatility in the situation. So what I'm seeing in C-suites is people want to find the new markets, but it's getting really desperately hard to get into these markets um, in a sort of sensible way. And so I think what it encourages is a kind of wait and see mentality, um, you know, and a bit more of sort of caution around risk. And of course, that has knock-on effects. Um, so although, you know, actually we've all had a number of very good corporate years, there still seems to be this feeling that everyone's very worried about the economy and how things will actually do, even though it's actually going quite well. And that sort of hesitancy. Um, and what you probably really need is agility and responsiveness, but of course that can be very hard, and especially when you're dealing with um, just-in-time supply and things like that, where you don't have that depth. I think this is something that we'll carry on pushing with this transactional trend. And you have to remain agile to be able to do it. The advice we gave to people who said we must go into Iran, how do we do it, was you know, don't take anything you can't walk out with. Um, you know, get your foot in the water, make friends, be there, but be ready to pull out and, and understand what the triggers are when you might have to walk away from the business. You know, don't go in with a 30-year plan and start dumping lots of money in plant and things like that. So it's sort of understanding that as best as one can to make the decisions and I think at least mitigating the risks you're taking in these new markets. But it, you know, you've got to get in there because the pressures are such that, that you must. Um, and there are a lot of those places growing in the next 20, 30 years. Okay, let's go back up to the top. I warned you, it was cheerful. All right, so we've done bottom left, top right. Let's pick another one. Go on. Run the bell, okay. The alarm bell. Um, interstate and hybrid conflict. I mean, this is actually very timely. So I was, I normally like to do my presentations, honestly, the day before, because things always happen when I do them early. I got this one in on Friday, and immediately Saudi Arabia and Iran cooked off. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I know this is what happens. Um, we, we've heard a lot about hybrid conflicts and, um, you know, the trends around a lot of this. I think, are you mostly familiar with the term about hybrid conflict? Yes, yeah, so this is this new idea that, you know, it's not just, and this is not a new idea, actually, but um, it's not just physical combat anymore, you know, played by sort of Queensbury rules and everyone lines up and has a go at each other. It's the information space, it's deniability, it's the cyber domain, which keeps most of us up at night. Um, frankly, I view it all as the same battle on a different map, you know, and I think, you know, the world is in conflict at the moment. I think that's undoubtable. Um, but we're doing it in such a way that it's deniable. I should add at this point, I live in Salisbury in the UK, and you may have heard of Salisbury because of the Russians who came to visit the cathedral and, um, there, and um, real cathedral enthusiasts, because uh, they went twice in two days. Um, you know, I live there, I don't go twice there in two days. So, uh, you know, this is, um, you know, this is happening you know, on our doorsteps, and we know this, um, and we've suffered things in this country for it as well. So, the reality is, though, that conflict is remaining focused on the places that it kind of suits us to have conflict. You know, so Syria is an example. I mean, a lot of people have effectively been able to deal with their competing interests in that arena. You know, so even though you have Iran and Saudi, who really are going at each other and have done for about five years, it's been maintained in certain areas of clear fault lines, Yemen, Syria. It's now starting to spill over, which is dangerous, but it's still deniable. Everything that people are doing is deniable. And um, the things that we're doing to Iran are somewhat deniable as well, but we send a message about them because of what we do. So, you know, the traditional fault lines remain the areas of threat. But we're not looking at a conflict in Western Europe. You know, we're not looking at a conflict in Latin America. Uh, you know, we're looking at the places we're used to thinking of as having conflicts, but they are becoming intensified by external pressures. It's good in that, if you don't live there, at least it's good, in that it's, it's a sort of exhaust valve for a lot of tensions that are building up in other places. Um, but there's always the risk of these things boiling over. And I have this view, it's like stacking empty glasses. Eventually, you stack too many empty glasses and the whole lot topples over. So that, that's the kind of risk with these areas to me. And I'd look also at the Russian periphery and the Chinese periphery for, for areas of tension. Um, but for now, deniability is there, and it's that cyber and information blend that I think is keeping people up at night the most. Um, and you know, we've provided the perfect environment to do this. I think we are becoming wiser, uh, but the growth 
will be regulation around that. And you've always got the tension, certainly in Western democracies, between free speech and you know, how much we need to regulate companies and how much are people responsible for curating what's on their platforms. That will carry on, and I think um, there'll be more and more focus on trying to break up large tech firms, um, coupled with other people defending them robustly. So I think that'll be an area of, of much debate, certainly in the West. Um, it is undoubtable that some other countries view those things as a great opportunity and um, obviously a, a great avenue for them to achieve effects on us. Um, and we do live in a world where an attack from Russian sources on Ukraine can shut down an African port you know, and then affect a US company. Um, the connectivity of this stuff and the speed it's moving, it, we all suffer from it. I probably don't need to labor that. But um, you know, that spillover effect, again, uh, is marked. And this is one of the areas. I'd add space as well. And you're starting to see concerns about um, GNSS systems, so GPS systems, and the ability to spoof GPS. And of course, we're, we're living off this now. We're actually shutting down radio nav aids for aircraft, because we can just use GPS. But actually, GPS can be turned off, or spoofed, or corrected. So to some extent, I think you know, we're removing resilience at the same time as we're accepting a need to bring it back. Um, and finally, then, that global approach. Um, you know, again, this is networked. Um, these things are hitting companies across different domains. And if we carry on responding in silos, we won't be able to, to do this. Have a holistic view of risk. OK, let's go back up to the top. Just a couple more to do. OK, so let's see which we haven't had. Right, so we've got the information icon. And we've got the megaphone. Who wants the megaphone? Megaphone. Who wants the information icon? Okay, megaphone wins. What are the rest? The rest of you just want me to shut up. Okay, I've got the five-minute warning. All right. Okay, disruptive technology, non-state actors. I mean, this is starting to pick up on what we've seen already. Um, is this an opportunity or a threat? You know, and we've talked about human 2.0. There's massive advantages there. There's some massive things that we could actually destroy our entire way of life. It's like the sort of Kodak digital film moment writ large for the entire human race, isn't it? Um, we could change ourselves out of business. So... You know, what is it? And I think the international community doesn't know how to react. And I think there is, again, this threat with the fact that the international community isn't cohesive. So um, we talked about that already, the fragmentation. So will we see, you know, new forms of warfare? I think we've already seen one in the last weekend. You know, drones being launched and cruise missiles being done deniably uh, to strike a neighboring country, um, you know, within some of these things where technology is changing the environment. Um, human rights, you're seeing some huge things around this. I'm aware of tech firms that are doing things in the name of supporting risk and safety that um, I know for a fact other people then find to be great violations. You know, where is, where is good in this? If you stop someone from self-harm, is that a worthy thing? Or are you spying on them? You know, Tanya. Yes, I would say a loss about it, but yes, I am. Yeah, it's that of a very complex, I mean, it's mass surveillance and to an extent that we've never seen. But it's old things writ large in the modern era making use of modern technologies. And I think the most significant thing about it in a way, I mean, you know, that's a different political system. They have their, their ways of approaching things. Um, I think the bigger thing with that is, you know, when we look here, where we're trying to use some of the same technologies and the outcry against it. And I think, you know, in all cases, I mean, the Chinese would argue they're doing it for good. They want, I mean, they've shut down Xinjiang because they're very worried about Etim and the fact that these people used to run around knifing people. Um, you know, they were having bombs in Beijing, and they said, right, we need to stop this. But the way that they went about stopping it was pretty heavy-handed. Of course, the Chinese might say that we were heavy-handed in Afghanistan and Iraq. So, um, you know, there's no right answers. And I think that's the point I have with it, in a way, is um, there's undoubtedly going to be this battle between human rights and what these technologies offer. And perfect security is when you lock everyone in their own homes at night, you know, and you say it's for your safety, so actually you're all secure. And so I think we'll see more and more stuff around this. And again, things that can be seen as the best idea in the world one year can be seen as evil and nasty the next year, and that can move real quick. So I think the biggest thing is the ethical consideration I'd like to highlight around these things, which I know comes out anyway, but I think there's been a rush towards good ideas and potential sometimes, and not enough thinking about, okay, but is this really the right thing to do? And governments have let companies run into this space so far. I'll come on to more on that in a second. Um, the other thing I'll bring out, I guess, is the unpredictability of that. And, you know, threats obviously can take advantage of this because they don't care. Um, I think the risk of also saying we need to embrace these things to stop the threats is actually potentially more damage to our society. So, you know, we do need to have a careful balancing act, and governments are not equipped to do it. That's my bottom line on it. We'll see more debate about this next year. Okay, we've got one left, so let's we'll go back up to the top, and then we'll pick the last one, uh, which is the information icon. 
Okay, so policy flux in Western economies. I think you'll see that all these themes interrelate. Um, elections, though, and change, I mean, the real thing here is that we're moving away from the middle ground. And you've seen that here. We certainly see it in the, US, uh, in the UK at the moment. Um, and there's this move towards the margins all the time. And it's sort of, you know, it's splitting things. And everyone feels split along a lot of lines, even within families. You know, you can't sit down at Thanksgiving and talk to each other anymore. Um, you know, and we're seeing a lot more of that next year. There's some quite significant elections to look out for. Um, and I think actually some of the, uh, you know, some of the key emerging markets um, are also not doing all that well and are really kind of stagnating. In the meantime, you have Argentina as the world's only formally developed country that's now going backwards. So, you know, we do live in an environment where people are quite threatened by this change and with these key electoral moments. I think even in Israel at the moment, you're kind of seeing political stagnation as people just can't pick the size of the divide. Um, I think that'll carry on, and I think, again, that'll paralyze decision-making more. And what it does mean you might be heading for is quite uncertain regulation, which is what will affect most of us. You know, so it's this area here, technology in the EU, um, potentially whiplash policies, populist policies on either side of the agenda to try and snag some votes in what's fundamentally a 50-50 market. And then finally, economic threats. Um, you know, we, there's a pretty much an expectation everywhere there will be an economic slowdown by 2022. It could well come next year. And a number of these things feed into that. Um, we saw a pretty big oil price shock. Um, we've had that already. So I think more complexity and divergence is the answer to that. And, okay, if we move on then, if we click on that one, please. Thank you. All right, so that was the five points. I'm aware I've used sort of most of my speaking time. Um, I'm happy to take any questions on those uh, at the end. Um, the only thing I'd say against all this, are you using best practice? Um, what I've seen recently, and I don't know how many of you are doing this, but actually I've seen some companies have mapped their entire supply chain and actually within their own control centers when they see, for example, a hurricane or an incident, they're able to see which of their suppliers have been impacted. So I think spotting that second order threat, I've not seen that widely, certainly from the security point of view, so I really recommend that to you because you probably have information on your suppliers, where they are, what components they produce for you, how critical they are. If your security team understand that, they can probably start telling you that you're about to have a supply chain disruption. Um, well ahead of the time. And I think too many people have been reactive to that. So I think if you can do that, that is one of the best things I've seen, and then to be able to do a risk model with it. You know, so it's being able to answer, I mean, Hormuz is an obvious one, how, you know, how much would be affected by that. But if you really model the situation between Iran and Saudi Arabia, you might then find that you have a connection somewhere else that's being affected by this. And as things get both less resilient and more potentially disrupted, I think better knowledge is gonna be your weapon. That's kind of my, probably my biggest takeaway about this. I suspect you have this knowledge. I think, again, it's making sure that the organization uses that knowledge and it's not reactive, you know, and you can actually get ahead of it. Um, we had a big issue in the UK where there was uh, an oil refinery fire, it, uh, sorry, an oil storage fire. Uh, most companies said, yeah, we're fine. There was a bit of traffic disruption. It turned out that one of the companies next to it had been shut down by the fire and it did something like 80% of the UK's payroll. And so everyone then discovered they couldn't pay their people next week. Um, and that suddenly, you know, no one saw that coming. That's a place called Dunsfield a few years ago. Um, that's woken up a lot of people to the idea, actually, you need to see these you know, second-order threats. It's a point we've made before. Um, and finally, on Humans 2.0 and Futures, this is the work I'm doing with the UK MOD. Um, this is actually a Futures game we've developed for the National Security Council. For those of you who remember Steve Jackson games where you flip through the book and, you know, it says, do you go left or right in the maze, go to page 72, and you go, and then you get killed by an elf or something. And then you flip back very hard because <laughs> you put your finger in it. It's a bit like that, but it, we've worked through all the future scenarios, and... This was actually uh, Humans 2.0. I've got permission, it, it's for actually the UK Cabinet Office, but I've got permission to share it with you um, to take it. And actually there's some interest to see how a group of non-military, non-security people would address the same policy choices. So this looks at, you know, how will you invest in technology? Do you let markets do it? Do you let companies do it? Do you get the government to do it? Questions like that. It takes about 10 minutes, but um, it would be really helpful to me actually if you would be interested in doing it. Um, I'll ask to send out an email afterwards if I may, but I think it's also an interesting way of how to explore futures, you know, and actually how, um, you, know, you can see how different decisions will bring about different outcomes. There's actually 729 outcomes in it, so, you know, it's quite interesting journeys to be had, and they're not all the Terminator one, but a few of them are the Terminator one um, <laughs> that are in there, but it is, if you want to explore that topic we discussed this morning, that's on there. Okay, that's it. Um, I think we've still got a couple of minutes of questions, if anything's pressing, but otherwise, um, I'm around all day, so feel free to grab me and discuss the projects. Five minutes. Great.